Welcome to Brave Dynamics. This is your host, Jeremy Yao. Leadership is harder than it looks. As a proven founder and Harvard MBA, I interview courageous entrepreneurs, executives, and investors every week. I also share my frontline experiences, coaching insights, and own professional development journey. If you're stepping up as a new leader, founding a startup, or venturing into the great unknown, this is the podcast for you. Hey, Andrew, so excited to share your journey on the podcast today. Hey, Jeremy, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Well, you've had such an interesting career, and I can't wait to dig into your thoughts on the creator economy and how all these different courses and teachers are all popping around the world and your role in it. But we've got to start and go from the beginning. For those who don't know you yet, how do you share your professional journey? Yeah, so I started my career in South Africa, spent the first 20 odd years of my life there and joined a company called KPMG. So we're doing um, global consulting and it was always right away. So I'm actually a trained, qualified chartered accountant and CPA here in the state. So I was on the accounting path for a long time, but very quickly it was drawn for those big consulting firms. Training their people is a huge, huge investment they make, right? It's a big part of the, especially the apprenticeship part that you do in the first three years. And I was just always drawn to the other side of that to the teaching side of it. I wanted to do that right away as soon as I was going through those programs. So I, I reached out to people there, figured out how to get involved, and I started doing that. We used to fly around South Africa doing those presentations, those workshops, those five-day events. And then I got an opportunity to come to America. So came to New York 11 years ago with KPMG to develop training that we were then rolling out around the world. And it was just there that I really got into the nuts and bolts of adult learning and like the real like psychology behind it, a lot of great studies around that. I just started self teaching myself a lot of that. So I spent, I don't know, five or six years with KPMG here in the States. And then I joined a company called Lobster Inc, which is, well, was, it's been acquired now by Ecolab, but it was a video based training provider for the hospitality industry. So friends of mine in South Africa actually had started it. I helped them start a new office here in the States and became a head of learning. And so we were doing some really cutting edge stuff for really high quality video production for like Marriott, Hilton, like a lot of the big hotel brands. And so that was great. I just So then I started bringing multimedia into the sort of learning design that I was doing for workshops. And so five years ago, um, so I stayed at Lobstering for about a couple of years. And then five years ago, I started my own company, Curious Lion. And for the last five years, we've been helping companies develop training or I say reimagine the way they train their people. And people can be internal. It can also be customers. So I think there's a lot of great marketing that uh, has an educational focus. Yeah, so we've been doing that for five years now. We work with the likes of PagerDuty, Pinterest, KPMG, the NBA. So it's a whole wide range. And we're very content agnostic. Content doesn't matter. There are principles in all of this that help you develop transformational learning experiences. And that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been focusing on. So yeah, it's been a wild ride. I mean, it didn't end there. End of last year, I started realizing that what we've been doing at Curious Line for, for companies was, was useful for this world of online courses and the creator economy. Right. And I was always a big student of these. I spend thousands of dollars a year on these programs. I love them. I've had transformational experiences myself. And I started seeing stuff that they were doing, which was applicable to the companies I was working with, but and vice versa. And so I started just sharing a lot of my experience with people on Twitter. And it was literally like October of last year. I started doing this quite heavily. And within two months, I started getting a lot of interest from it. And by the end of that year, I was approached by On Deck. Eric Torenberg from on deck and he reached out to me he said hey you've been tweeting a lot about courses we've been looking to create a course creator fellowship they had been working on that for a while and we chatted on a Saturday morning like for an hour and we were just we were just so on the same page with how we saw the future of education and the potential for sort of creators for people to have a viable career viable business as I like to call them superstar teachers and so I, I didn't hesitate. I signed on with them and I've been there for now two years, two, two months, feels like two years. And we are launching our first fellowship cohort on April 4th. Amazing. We're going to go so deep into this creator economy and courses. But before we do that, I'd love to talk about, you said something special, right? Which was you fell into teaching and the learning. So how did you fall into it? Like, 
Was it something you grew up with? Was it something you're always passionate about? Like, how did you fall into it? It's so cool you picked up on that, Jeremy, because that to me is one of the cornerstone features or, or sort of attributes that a good teacher needs to have. And that is a passion for teaching. Like you really have to care about it because it's teaching is a skill and it takes like any skill, having that intrinsic motivation to learn it is so, so important. Right. And so that a lot of that comes from passion. So for me, it, I, I just really fell in love with it when you get to stand up in front of a, a room full of back in fact, there was like 40, 50, 60 people. And you take them through a five day workshop and teaching them about their, this career that they're just embarking on and sort of instilling in them ideas and mental models that they can use to become better at their careers. And when you see those sort of light bulb moments that people have when they're like, oh yes, like that's, this is what I've been looking for. And you see that transformation in people. It's, there's nothing better like that. I could do that forever. Do you remember what was the first class you ever taught? Were you at KPMG? Were you, what, what was it like? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it would have been uh, audits, uh, sort of the fundamentals of auditing. So kind of, I remember taking like, so the risk-based approach is, is a big, big part of auditing. I remember I used to enjoy sort of unpacking the concepts and trying to find ways to analogize them to something else. And I did this whole thing on Sun Tzu's art of war, know yourself, know your enemy and sort of related that to the risk assessment thing. And it was so fun and, and people enjoyed that. So yeah, that was definitely the first memory I have of doing this. Were you scared or were you excited? Like, do you, like, what was it like? Yeah. Your five senses. Yeah. Oh man. Like so scared. And I still get scared. And so that's a good sign. That means you're, there's, that's energy, right? That nerves and energy to me are the same thing. And so even coming onto this podcast, like if I don't feel nervous, that nervous energy, I'm not like my heart's not in it. Right. So yeah, definitely that's always there. But it was a lot worse at the beginning. Like this is something that you can practice. You can become a better speaker. You can become a better leader. I know it's something that, that you talked to a lot of guests about. So. Yeah. And I think there's something is true that you mentioned as well. Is just like, you know, one thing that I really enjoyed being in the consulting world as well is like there's a huge expectation for people to help teach their peers and the new people, right? Because I think there's this huge wheel of consultants rotating in and out of system that they have a huge learning and development function where they're like stamping all these consultants into like, these are the widgets that will power our brain and trust here. But we also need to leverage everybody to help train each other, right? I think that's where I also, to some extent, discovered my love to do like peer coaching, not in training to some extent as well, right? So that's a funny part that you mentioned, like consulting is a, is a farming ground for that. Yeah, the, you'd love this. The, I've, I've been working on this idea of a learning flywheel specifically for organizations, but I think it's applicable to any type of learning. And there's basically four main sort of elements in the flywheel. I'll go through this pretty quick, but you've got the learner themselves, you've got their peer, because who is the learner and the counterpart, but they learn best from each other. People, we learn best from each other. And then as you get better, you become an expert. And then finally, and so what's interesting about that is how do we identify and amplify experts so others can benefit from their knowledge and then they become teachers and when you're teaching you are learning all the time and so you complete this amazing flywheel where you just you're learning to teaching with all those stops along the way it's continuous and that's and so it brings to this whole like idea of lifelong learning and continuous learning like it doesn't end when college ends or when your professional degree ends could you share an example of you progressing along this lifelong learning cycle? Oh, yeah. So I think I always sort of pinpoint moments where you're out of your comfort zone as like big learning moments. I think there's such a big correlation between being out of your comfort zone and, and learning something. And for me, that was starting a new business. Being in the corporate world for 10 years, it's very comfortable. People pretty much tell you what you have to do. Like if you don't get it done, there's not massive consequences where if you have your own business, it's like, that's the end, right? Um, so, and you have to think about so many different new things that you don't normally have to think about. You just focused on being good at that thing you're good at, right? Now you have to focus on so much. So for me, that was a big curve and it took me a while. And I was a slow starter with, with my business in the first year or two. It was really, got, I got lucky with a couple of clients and that helped us get going. But it was a long process of learning. I think I could have tightened my feedback loops a lot more in those early days. But yeah, I mean, you just learn by doing and you just keep, you keep improving. Mm. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. As you think about that flywheel, and I think, I guess, is where we're starting to have a little bit of a robust conversation is obviously everyone's a beginner and then obviously people are learning from peers. So that's a no brainer. But I think what's interesting is the transition between a single person beginner learning from a peer and starting to rise, right? That's the interesting moment, right? Where they're like, they know they're starting to learn something. They're starting to get a better grip on it, but they, they're not an expert, right? And that's a really interesting stage, right? Because I think that's when so many people either drop out of courses. That's when a lot of people panic and leave in some sense. Uh, and a lot of people push through, right? So I was just kind of curious about jumping on that stage. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny. I just released a podcast episode. I do a show called How Did You Learn That? Where we interview, I interview people to talk, to like unpack how right, the process of learning. And but my last guest was a guy called Danny Miranda. We talked about the dip and it's that purple, you get this enthusiasm up front and then, and that almost always wanes and you have to like get over that dip, right? And so how do you do that? So two things come to mind, sort of related as well, is something that you talked about, you do clearly is as a mentor to people is find a mentor, right? Someone who knows the path and has seen, like knows what has made the mistakes and can sort of show you the way kind of the other thing is to have an accountability and that could be the same person but often it's someone who's at the same level as you going through the same thing as you and so i talk about that sort of mental being a journey leader and then you've got an account so it's a journey group and an accountability group and so having both of those i think is the thing that gets you over that dip and once you're over it it's just then you're accelerating your learning yeah that's really interesting uh, and I think what's interesting, especially, is the differentiation between the journey group and the accountability group, right? Because most people kind of lump them together in one giant <laughs> cluster. So I think that's what most people have that mental model of the group, right? We just dump and then everybody into one starting point. So how would you differentiate between that versus a journey group and accountability group? So, yeah, so I mean, I'll throw, I call what I think you were describing there as the destination group. So you've got those three. Yeah, so destination, then it's the smallest group within that journey and the smaller group within that accountability. So the destination group is that like college, that's the lecturer, right? That's like the program you're doing. And so it's setting like, okay, this is, this is the history of philosophy. And it's like laying it out for you. And this is what you're going to cover over the semester, and blah, blah, blah. But what that doesn't do is it doesn't account for everyone being on a very different level of that journey. So some people may have some base knowledge in it. Some people may have studied something already around that. Some starting completely fresh, never heard of it before. And so you have to have smaller groups and that's where the mentors come in to, to be able to address the next step. So destination groups, like all the steps and then, but people only care about the next step, right? You can't even think about step 12 if you, you can't go from two to three, right? That's the journey group. And then accountability is like, okay, cool. I know what I need to do. Now I just need to sit down and do it. It's so much easier to do that with someone who's also in that same boat. So it's like, all right, it's like going to gym, right? Like, and you're like, if you promise someone you're going to go to the gym, you're much more likely to go because you made a promise to someone than if it was just you and you just hit snooze, you don't have that accountability. Yeah, definitely true. It's interesting because, I mean, just like you, I've always been thinking about education. I've been at education technology as well. And I always joke, like, sometimes, like, once you see, like, uh, the matrix, I guess, you can't stop seeing it, right? So when you talk about destination group, journey group, accountability group, I'm like, yeah, you see that everywhere, right? You see that in personal training, at the gym, right? The gym is a good example of all those three things, right? Like, the super buff guy in the corner was clearly the expert. The destination. <laughs> the destination yeah. group. Then you have all the beginners, <laughs> you know, January 1st, New Year resolution, folks. <laughs> then you have the trainers walking around to serve as your accountability as well as you know, provide some of the content. But you see that everywhere, right? You see that yeah. in like the corporate training program, obviously. You see that in online courses. You even see that on like online YouTube course, uh, not courses, but YouTube creators kind of like sharing that. Is there any funny moments where you've been like doing something and then you were like, oh, I see what they're doing? Yeah, oh, yeah. It's so like, wow, these are good questions. So I was in, I'll tell you this whole destination journey and accountability group idea came to me because... So I was in Rite of Passage as, as a student. For those who don't know, it's a, a course, David Perel, um, how to write online, basically, a five-week course. And so I did it like in 2019, didn't really get much out of it, but that was my fault because I didn't put enough in. 
And then in 20, last year, in July, I applied to be a mentor. So you, as an alumni, and it was the first time they were doing mentors. And I got accepted into that program and it was amazing. So I got to work with David, who's you know done some phenomenal stuff in his career and work closely with him and Will Madden and really to build that from the ground up like that we and they were very cool about just like okay you guys are on the front lines doing this like we basically built a lot of that program together there was seven of us and so it was amazing like i used to run these weekly sessions and people would would join and we had you know david did two sessions a, a week which were like for a lot of people when i first did it was super intimidating it's like this guy's a prolific writer a massive following and he's telling you all this stuff which you know is good it's important but you're just like i just need to like sit down and write like i'm struggling with the blank page issue like what's a or imposter syndrome who am i to write and share and publish my stuff online and so the accountability or the sorry the journey groups the mental groups gave people that opportunity to talk about those things because you can't do that in the live sessions right that's you've got 60 minutes maybe 90 minutes and that's it like you can't deal with everyone's those concerns so those groups became i would host this weekly session it was just basically a facilitated discussion about these challenges which was great because it got people writing, got them publishing, it got them just like taking those next steps. And so it was phenomenally successful. And that cohort, particularly cohort five was just, I mean, David, like on the last session broke down in tears. It was like this cathartic release of emotion. It was incredibly, there was insane amount of transformation in people. So I took some time off. That was in August in the summer. I was on a run in the morning. I was listening to a podcast with Shane Parrish interviewing DJ Fogg, Stanford professor. And he was talking about this concept of destination leaders and journey leaders, not in the context necessarily of learning and training, but I can't remember what the context was because I, I like stopped in my tracks and I was like, oh my God, that's exactly what we were doing. That's the perfect way to describe the difference. So I went to like Google that and he hadn't written anything about it. I didn't, to this day, I think that was the first time he'd spoken about it that was recorded. So I just started writing about it. This is this idea from BJ Fogg, like applies so well to what we were doing in Rite of Passage. I wrote a whole thing on that. And that's sort of when I really started writing about online courses and really sort of deconstructing how to build them. But yeah, that was kind of like a, a wild moment. So I, that was quite crazy. I think I stopped the run and just went back home. <laughs> So what's interesting, of course, is, you know, we've been talking about courses, but when you describe these courses now, you didn't describe it in terms of the knowledge part, right? You described it, you could call it the emotional part, right? You used the word catharsis, right? Tears. It's very emotional, right? So, and I think we're kind of like talking about it, but what's the role? I mean, this is a bit of a rhetorical question because I know you've written a lot about it, but what's the role of that catharsis or emotion as part of the course, I guess? Yeah, so it's so interesting. It's it's sort of related. It goes back to to motivation as well. People have to be inspired to take action, and that often comes from a deep emotional connection to wanting to do the thing, whatever it is, like the, a writing course. And so, what they do really well in that program, and a lot of other great course creators do, is design ways for people to first of all reflect on why they're doing it, and to share that with the course creator. Because what that does is just like opens it up and puts it on the table of like really why, like what difference is this going to make to my life to learn this thing? Once you've made that, it's made, you kind of made a commitment to it. And it is, it is like a deeply emotional thing. I think it's true for pretty much anything, but certainly for the creator economy, creating anything, right? Putting out writing, making YouTube videos, like there's so much of your soul that has to go into that, that you've really got to deal with some demons to be able to kind of get that, that stuff out and to learn how to do it well, because it's almost just like, it goes back to the destination journey thing. To even go on the destination, you have to start your journey. And the starting is sort of the hard part. So I think that's that's why the emotion plays another part. A, a sort of related part with emotion is it also captures attention. So attention and, and emotion are, are linked in quite a deep way. And so especially when you're a course creator or any kind of creator, you want to capture attention by the way, like any book, right? You, if you, or article, you read the first sentences, you need to like feel the emotion of the writer to, to want to, okay, cool, I'll, I'll read the rest of this. So yeah, I think that it plays in a lot of different ways, but those are two, two that jump to mind. Yeah, I want to go deep on this. You said something really interesting, right? You said catharsis is linked to motivation, right? Oh, so that's really interesting, right? Because those are two words you don't normally hear the same 
sentence, I would say. And this might be the first time I ever heard them in the same sentence. So you start with motivation because people are coming in motivated. Let's unpack that. And then you end with catharsis. So why? Yeah. So, and that being like the release of that emotion, right? It's interesting. I think you've, you've sketched that out nicely that that's the, it starts with the motivation piece. And so let's break that down. So most emotion or sorry, motivation is intrinsic and extrinsic, right? So I think everyone will agree. The most powerful one is the intrinsic one, right? So that's the thing as a course creator, you want to be tapping in on. So, so you see this in, in corporate training, go back to that for a second, like, motivating completion of courses is done extrinsically. So there's like badges and gamification and stuff to like get people to do the, the thing to finish the training. But that just doesn't do the trick, right? You have to connect with the intrinsic piece. So it's about connecting with, if you're now the, the person doing the training or creating the course, it's about connecting what they want with what they need. You know what they need, right? You know the destination. I mean, that sort of, is implied, I think, by the fact that you're doing a course teaching people this thing. So you know what they need, you've got to identify what they want and then help them connect the dots. So the want is the intrinsic motivation, the need is that transformation. And I think the catharsis of that is like, when you get to that point, you like, you realize like, wow, my life has actually changed for the better. And that's the cathartic moment. And so it comes to a head in an online course because I mean, that last session of his course and, and many now are like sharing wins. So it's like a celebration of like what people have done and talk about so-and-so created this project. I did one on, on speaking, performative speaking. And it was, everyone presented a, they did a live speech. And it was just like amazing. You saw this visual, like visceral difference between where they were at the beginning and where they were at the end. And I think that's where the catharsis comes from. Wow, that's deep, right? Because I think what you're really saying is, as a trainer, your role is to connect with what they want, with what they need, right? And that's such a, I don't know, <laughs> it sounds like a crazy thing, but I, that's really deep, actually. And also, I like what you said about extrinsic motivation and causes. I mean, yeah, I don't think I've ever cried at the end of every, any training at Bain as a management consultant. Yeah. I, was a, I was like, oh, I learned Excel, you know, I just broke yeah. out crying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. But I think you're right to say that in reflecting like, yeah, you know, like when I graduated from undergrad, people crying, it was a graduation or commencement, right? I would definitely say that I think Harvard, when I did the MBA, obviously you're sinking a quarter million dollars into the process. Yeah. So maybe you're crying a little bit around your wallet going in. <laughs> but at the end of that process, yeah, people were just sobbing, just saying goodbye to two years and I don't know, the onset of middle age or whatever it was, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was a real sadness and I, I, could, I felt that. I mean, I was like, wow, like we had some had an adventure together, right? So yeah, I definitely can see that. I'd love to get you go deeper into what you said, right? So it was like, as a trainer, as a creator, your job is to create the link between what they want versus what they need, right? And I think that's like the pain of every artist, right? <laughs> every artist, you know, is like always doing the same connection between what the consumer wants versus what the artist feels they need. I think it's the pain of every social entrepreneur <laughs> and nonprofit leader who's connecting what the people want versus what they need. I think it's the pain of every parent, right? Between the connection between what every kid wants versus what a kid needs, right? So tell us more, like how, what's the tip there? Is there a tip there? Like what's the struggle there? Maybe less about a tip because we know the tips, but what's the real struggle there from your perspective? Yeah, this is super interesting. So. So as a teacher, as a parent, as a social entrepreneur, as any of those things you mentioned, you have a, a duty of stewardship, right, over the people that are sort of coming into that thing to learn from you or to into your care or whatever. So you have a duty of stewardship, which I think a key component of it is you have to build trust right away, right? So as the destination leader, you set out a, a set of steps that people need to follow, right? And you're saying like, this is you're reverse engineering your own experience, your own process of getting to where you are. And now people need to trust that that process is going to be right for them to get them to where they are, to where they want to be, rather, right? So there's such a, this is such an important and delicate thing for someone in all those roles you just talked, we talked about is how do you get that trust? Because it's a commitment, it's a process, and it won't be obvious at the beginning and you're going to have that dip that we talked about and you're going to like not want to do it. And so you have to like 
forget and constantly remind people that trust me, this process will get you there. Like you have to, you have to just trust me because it won't seem obvious until you're there. Right. So that's a super interesting thing. Like I, I don't actually know if there are a bunch of good tips for this. Like just thinking about human psychology and, and behavior, like how do you build trust in people? So I think being authentic, being honest, providing value up front, a lot of those things can help with that, right? So people can get a taste of like, okay, this is this person's is who they say they are and they can probably help me, right? Yeah, I mean it all comes that you have to get them to just take the leap of faith. And it's a bit of a blind leap, right? But when you go on these on these learning journeys. Yeah, I don't know. What what are your thoughts on that? Because I think this is just such an interesting area that's not it's not being solved. I mean you're saying something it's like that's a sauce, right? You know, it's like the trust, right? Like, can I trust you on a destination? Like, yeah, do I trust you? Like, I mean, I think McKinsey actually made a whole book on this. They had a, they call it the trust equation. Uh, and then they, they boil it down to like credibility and reliability. Actually, it's a really good, I actually use that trust equation. It's, it's a great, you should check it out. You can definitely tweet about it. And I think they do a good job unpacking that into, off the top of my head, credibility is one aspect, reliability and actually de- deploying that. And of course, the magnitude about what you're trusting them with, right? Because trusting you that you give me my pencil back is very different from trusting you that you're going to get secure me a job at this company versus trusting you for you. I mean, like in a therapist relationship, trusting that you will ferry me through whatever the storm is, right? Totally different magnitudes of trust required. And in, and in all these cases as well, there's a commitment of time that you're asking your students or the people that are, that are joining you to make, right? So there's always that. And that's like the greatest gift anybody can give you is their time. So you've got to really earn that. Yeah, it's super interesting. I'm definitely going to check that out because I think there's a lot of reflection that people who want to go into education, teaching, but even all the things you mentioned as well, social entrepreneurship, is it's so important to reflect on, okay, what are those elements of trust and am I showing those? Yeah. And so obviously I think you and I are kind of like rediscovering or reinventing what people have done in person for generations, right? From the beginning of time, right? You're the hit, the hit, the hit man of the village, the priest, yeah. you know, uh, the mayor, the police officer, like there's a whole bunch of them, the teacher, right? So we're recruiting that. But what is it about the internet, with a capital T, capital I, that makes us different and say, this is worth rediscovering in this context? We're talking about principles that are very institutionalized, right? Like every priest will learn the same way, right? If that makes sense, uh, about what it means to be a coach and a teacher, right? You know, in a spiritual sense, right? I think obviously the school systems are all institutionalized. In the internet, we have this no zero borders, zero marginal cost of distribution, infinite affinities that you can cut yourself by. So there's lots of different ways that the internet today, I don't know, it feels like we're rediscovering education and courses but for the internet world. Yeah. So I think this is such an, a fascinating space for people because so a lot of the, I think the implications of, of what you just described there is that access to information is no longer the issue, right? It's users of, of internet is, is going up pretty much everywhere in the world. There's amazing like penetration in, in third world countries now of, of internet, especially mobile. So access to information is not not the issue anymore. So now it's about curation and about finding the right person to trust. In fact, we actually have the opposite problem. We have too much information, right? So so now the issue becomes curation. And I, I believe one of the best ways to learn these days is to learn from someone who is curating it for you, who's setting out the pathway, you know, providing that destination. And so it's a way to kind of organize that information and organize that path for you. And that can now happen on scale. I've been looking up, I came across recently this thing called the Global Teacher Prize, which is this amazing organization. They've been doing it since like 2016 or something, five or six years. And every year they, they announce um, like the best teacher in the world. Who And these people have done phenomenal things. And what's interesting is like, so the last two in 2019 was a guy called Peter Tabichi from Kenya. And then last year was a guy called Ranjan Dasali from India. And both of them are in very rural parts of those two countries. But like this, Dasali has like this huge, he uses Skype. And so he has this, he does a whole bunch of science lessons. He's a science, they're actually both science teachers. 
they do a lot of that on video. So there's so in his case, especially people well, he's been teaching mainly in one small part of India, but now it's like anybody in India can learn a science lesson from him. And he's really good at that. And then so I think this is where it gets interesting, is that so the scale of that instruction of sort of setting out the destination, the motivation and, and sort of emotional side of it, because like he's excited about these science experiments, right? So experiments that the kids watching it are as well. So you can now anybody in the world can have access to that. And then what starts to happen, I think this is where, especially as the world opens back up again, is you have in-person places, schools for people to go who are watching that same stuff when in their own time, who then go to then apply those things. And that's where mentors, so that's the little journey groups, but they're like live in-person journey groups in your geography. And so you can go there and you can be in a mentors to sort of guide you through implementing some of the stuff you've seen online practicing it, learning from each other. What are your challenges? How did you approach it? So that becomes super interesting. Where like my kids and your kids could be watching the same teacher, right? And then go and apply it to, you know, where you are in the world, and where I'm in the world with people near them. And that's super, super exciting to me. I think that's a crazy part of the internet, right? Because we've gone from this like factory model of education where Everyone's debating, you know, should we have 20 students per teacher or should we have 30 students per teacher, right? And then the science is basically saying, well, reducing class size doesn't help if the quality, because quality of teachers is more important, right? So, so that's, that's where the economists have gotten us because we're working off the data from the past 10 years, right? But now the internet is letting us go the other direction, which is, but what if we had a superstar teacher, right? Not just that a good teacher or a slightly worse teacher in the whole system. But what if you had a rock star teacher, right? Who was like really fun, really engaging, just doing one thing really, really well. What if you had like a million <laughs> students, right? And, and economists are just kind of like, well, we don't know how to measure that because we don't have the data for that. And then you just see this wow, wow, west of like TikTok yeah. and Skype and all these science lessons. I probably watch more like the slow motion guys on YouTube. I mean, I don't know. It's like cheap trail, right? It's just like slow motion stuff, right? Yeah. Things breaking, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait a moment. I'm learning so much about physics that I never learned as a kid. And it's just doing one, I don't know, one format, which is everything in slow-mo, right? A hummingbird or just like a lizard. And I'm just like, okay, I enjoy this, right? You know, for three minutes a day. There's something about that. It's, it's obviously captured your attention, right? And so that was the key. And it's like, so that's, it's fascinating and you want to just stare at it. And then now you're in and now you're learning. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just the power of us now, like you said, distribution is, is infinite. Like you, anything, anybody can get their knowledge out. So that's super interesting. Then that whole, what you were saying as well about the superstar teacher thing, there's a whole sort of study around, done around that. Like, what is the implication? of that if that starts to happen in a big way, right? Like right now, there are very few people, South Korea has an amazing system where teachers there can earn millions of dollars a year. There are few people in the US have done it through like Udemy and Coursera and those sort of platforms, but it's still just like the top 0.1%. So as that starts to, I think that there is a lot more scope for that to have more and more people be able to do that make viable businesses, right? Actual, like sustain themselves, like be able to quit their jobs. That is their only job, which is often not the case for teachers, right? It is super interesting. And, and so, yeah, there's a whole paper on like the economics of that, of, of superstar teachers and what that might look like. Sort of, because it becomes a little bit of a winner takes all scenario, right? Like, and there's good and bad things with that, which it means that the people that aren't able to teach really well or communicate really well, lose out. Because now those those kids that they were teaching are just going to learn online from the person who's the best, right? But partially offset by the fact that those people could find different jobs being TAs and being mentors and being coaches to help students implement. So I think it's super super interesting to think about how that's all going to play out. And we're, we're at the beginning of that wild, wild west you talked about. Amazing. So let's talk about this. Obviously, you know, you're out creating the cohort for OnDeck and cost creators. So what is it? Is it like your job is to like spot middle-class aspiring cost creators who you think could potentially hockey stick into the superstar creators? Is that how you're thinking about approach? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, I actually love that hockey stick into it. I, I just, it does feel a bit like that, to be honest. So 
wh I went into it thinking and sort of maybe more broadly, but this is still, this is still applicable is to create the world's only global community for course creators and for superstar teachers. And so, and, and cause like right now there's lots of different communities where course creators can go and learn, but they're like tangential to other things like writing, marketing, certain platforms even, but there's no place where like course creators go and talk and be with course creators and go through a guided journey to, to learn to improve their craft. So that was sort of the overall, the overarching thing, but you're, you're hundred percent right. Like that's such a, you nailed it there because I'm right now in the middle of Canada in interviews, right? So it's just like back to back 15 minute interviews with people who are applying. And I'm just, I'm meeting just like the most amazing people who, who have the most diverse set of skills and expertise. And, and I can tell right away if that person's in it for the joy, the passion of teaching and wants to share that with someone. And if they're in it to like make a quick buck. Right. And so to me, I'm like very clear uh, it, online, like we're, I'm happy to kind of start a, an internet beef with this other so, sort of side of online courses, which is like how to make a hundred K a month, all that sort of thing, where it's just like, oh, it's, there's like a whole like clubhouse little section that does this. It's, it's, everyone knows, I think who's listening is familiar with this world knows what I'm talking about. And we're the opposite of that. Like that is not, that's not what we're doing yet. And so I can tell right away if someone's like, I, I'm happy to send them to those people, like go and go learn from them. This is about creating real transformation for people. And you know what? The beauty is actually that you will also make a lot of money doing this, right? Like that's, that's the cool thing about it, but it's not the primary thing. And so if you focus on transformation and you really relentlessly ensure that your students are getting transformed or having that opportunity to, then you're going to do well. Like they're going to tell everyone about that because who wouldn't, right? Like that's the beauty of it. So yeah. I mean, I'm sure you already know how meta it is, right? Which is on deck, which is probably like an engine of creating courses, now creating a course about creating courses, which of course means you're subject matter experts on this. But I mean, do you feel like, do you ever laugh, have a convo call and be like, wow, distilling our own secret sauce, I guess? All the time. Like, I think it's hilarious. It's, and, and it's actually a lot of pressure because it's because it's so meta. Like, I, I'm going to be teaching people, like, the things you should be doing. So I have to be demonstrating what you should be doing. And it's, I've got, like, a, a whole hour sort of course map of what it's going to look like. And there's so many elements that go into making an online course. And, and I'm genuinely quite nervous that I'm not going to be able to, like, show all of those things the right way. So sometimes they're going to have to listen to what I say and not what I do, but it's a work in progress and we'll, we'll have a lot of fun kind of doing that. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's ridiculously meta. It's going to be, it's going to be really cool to like talk about that with people who are creating courses, like all our fellows. <laughs> and you know, obviously we won't get into the the exact A or B or C. Obviously I've enjoyed on deck as a on deck fellow, ODF seven and a, part of the inaugural cohort for the podcasting group, ODP1. But I just want kind of curious is like being human here, obviously you're going to be creating your inaugural cohort. So that's exciting. But I guess kind of curious, I know every course creator has that mental roadmap, right? This is where it is going to be is today. This is what it's going to be in the next quarter, in the next three months. And this is what I wish I could build out or like that's like, and obviously there's a big destination at the end, right? You know, whatever that is. But I'm just kind of curious, like if you zoom in, like, you know, as a human cost creator, like what are the parts that you think you're going to be, it's going to be a process or that you will need to improve or build on top of, right? Yeah. So I think the one of the key things will be to, so to ensure a transformation for people who have an online course is, is incredibly difficult to do in just eight weeks. If I also, I mean, I think eight weeks is quite long for an online course, but it's also still not long enough to, to ensure that people who have a whole course themselves experience a full transformation. So this was one of the challenges we looked at. I'm convinced that we'll, everyone will have, and if they, they spend the time, we'll, we'll be able to improve elements of their course. Or if they don't have one yet, we'll have everything in place to eventually launch it. But like the transformation is only complete once you've launched it and people have taken it and they've given you feedback. And so you need that. That's a bit of a longer tail. So one of the things we're going to do is have a, a workshop that everyone works on, almost like a capstone, which they will present in the ninth week, the final week to anyone. So all on deck fellows, you'll get to hear about this. We'll be able to attend these things. And just imagine there's like two, three, four day events. You can go and just 
sort of go into a bunch of virtual rooms and listen to someone teach their topic. And so that's that was like an aha moment for me when I realized, okay, we can actually do this meta course thing because we can give people that like immediate feedback and and potentially even a little distribution boost if they get exposure to a lot more people in that ninth week. Then they can go off and apply everything else they've learned to launch their full course and beyond. Wow, you just said something really interesting here, right? Which is eight weeks is too short for transformation, but it's too long for an online course. Wow. Okay. We gotta <laughs> unpack this one, baby. This is a really good one, right? Okay. Yeah. Because it's like what? Is this like what Goldilocks, the tree bears? You know? <laughs> okay, so so let's unpack the first part. Eight weeks is too short for personal transformation. What does that mean? Yeah, for the online course specifically, for creating an online course, because you've got to, to really see the benefit of it, you've got to release it out into the wild, you've got to have students join, and then that takes a lag, there's a lag, there's a tail to that, so eventually get student feedback, and, and then that completes the cycle of like, okay, did I do a good thing here? Did I build a good course myself? So for all my fellows, they're going to only see that in one, two months after the fellowship. So that's why I say it's, it's too short to see that, and that's why we're going to do that that learning conference idea so they can see it right in the ninth week what that feedback is like and be able to get a few people to kind of take a live session and like give them feedback on it so, so and then too long this might be controversial a lot of my colleagues at on deck might take sort of not offense but it might might question this because most of our fellowships are eight weeks six, six seven eight weeks nine weeks and it just it sort of just depends i think this is very much this is not like i don't feel super strongly that it's too long I think it depends. The, I look at it as like learning is a marathon or a sprint. And so it's somewhere along that spectrum, right? The writing course I mentioned, Rite of Passage, the speaking one, performative speaking, Robbie, those are five weeks. So that's a super intense sprint, you know, and it's, you've got like two, three live sessions a week. It's a lot of work. You're doing a, a, an assignment each week. So weekends, you're doing that basically. But it's great because you, you just, you crush it. You just go through and you get it done and you've learned a lot, right? Ali Abdel's YouTube course as well is four weeks, very, very tightly packed. Eight weeks gives you a bit more time to sort of explore the community side of it, I think, a bit more, which is, as you know, is a big part of, of the Undeck fellowships. So it's not too long. It's long, but it's the way to make it not too long is to make sure that it's the whole journey is very clear. So you know what you're getting into, right? in week six and seven this is what's going to be expected week eight this is what we're doing and so you can start like plan ahead for that like okay cool i'm running the 800 meters instead of the 100 meters wow that's uh i love that that's a whole hour into this uh the pedagogy i guess of online courses versus the transformation courses right those, those are two different planes even right one's online and, and one's in person let alone hybrid the other one you talked about is transformation versus, I guess, tools, I guess. And one thing I noticed about Dundeck is like, there's a geographic piece, right? Which is like, you guys were founded in the States, which makes sense, right? Because lots of talent, lots of supply of knowledge and so, so far. But what's really interesting, obviously someone who's like, kind of like shuttled between the States and Southeast Asia, for example, is that all these online courses obviously are being created in the US because of this strong pedagogy, strong, all this other stuff. But the real demand, I think, is going to be in the rest of the world, right? Outside America, right? Because they don't have Stanford, they don't have all the universities. Uh, and there's that interesting dynamic, right? Where Eric talks about disrupting all the existing universities. And then I read that thing and I'm like, but the rest of the world doesn't even have universities that are anywhere there. And so why are we um, fighting or charging existing incumbents, I mean, it's not a binary thing, but versus the rest of the world, right? That's hungry. So many people in Southeast Asia who just never ever even gotten anywhere close to thinking about cost creation or podcasting or founding even. Yeah, it's this is such a fascinating topic for me. And we think a lot about this at On Deck. So recently, we have someone who leads up our internationals, Erica Batista. She's this phenomenal dynamic from the Dominican Republic living in Paris. And so she's, she's very global in her thinking. And she's, she's like flat out said that we're not an, a U.S. company anymore. We're an international company. 
And so part of the, the thinking long term is to expand regional offices and have sort of regional heads. And so we've, we're looking at Israel right now as sort of the first of those. I know India is is, uh, is obviously a big one on the roadmap. I think Southeast Asia is definitely also. The other part of it is I, I've seen this with the Course Creator Fellowship. I've had so many applicants. There's someone in the Philippines who runs Avion School. So it's a boot camp school and, and he's doing incredible stuff down, down in the Philippines. And he, he's joined that this fellowship. I've got someone that, who does a marketing academy that put that connects people with jobs in marketing in Nairobi, in Kenya. And she's, you know, again, like phenomenal. So you're 100% right, like that hunger for this level of, of knowledge and community of people that can help you implement it and, and make real change in what you're doing is a completely global phenomenon. So that presents a, a bunch of challenges that, that we're currently exploring, right? One of them is obviously time zones. So most of the programming is sort of US centric, but we are starting to explore, like one of the things I'm going to be doing in the course creative fellowship is we'll have those mentor sessions we talked about. I've got mentors, someone, one, uh, it's a Spanish, a Spanish guy, but he lives in, uh, in Thailand right now. And like, so he's going to do one in that time zone. We've got someone who's going to, you know, Europe and we're going to have sort of the subcontinent of, of, of Asia. And so that's one way. So there'll always be a live thing you can attend in your time zone. And then we're also going to do watch parties. So we'll have all the live sessions are recorded, edited into videos, and we'll have opportunities for people in their time zone to watch it with others in their time zone and talk about it, discuss it. So you still get that benefit of that peer-to-peer -peer live discussion. So that's one, one challenge. The other one is global pricing. That's a very difficult one to solve. Like how do, no, not many people can afford a $2,000, $3,000 program, right? But it does take that much to put on one of these things. These things are very resource intensive. So how do you find ways to include people who can't afford that? The way we're doing it right now is we have an access fund that, so it's a donor advised fund that all fellows can contribute to as a way to kind of give back and sort of sponsor someone else. And so we, as program directors, are able to give scholarships to people, 25%, 50, 75, maybe even full scholarships to, to help that, right? But that's, that it's working, but it's limited only by how much people contribute. So it has a limited. So so I think global pricing is definitely something that I know we've been talking about a lot internally and some people in the company are focusing on that, what that might look like. Yeah, that is so true. And I love you sharing that from a personal uh, basis, right? Because I think that's something that so many course creators are struggling with, right? Because America kind of pioneered a lot of these online courses, but they're all global these days, right? You know, it's like YC, right? I mean, it used to be a, a US accelerator with their own training side. And now I'm part of a WhatsApp group, which is like YC Startup School Singapore, which is like all these Singaporean people taking the academy course by Y Combinator, right? And I'm just like, yeah, Y Combinator is no longer an American company. It's, and I think they originally tried to create like regional offshoots. And now they're just like, you know, we're just going to become a global HQ hub, right? So it's just interesting to see so many cost creators just basically run into the exact same dynamics as you are. Totally. I think it's going to be a long-term trend, definitely. Yeah. And I think it's going to be so exciting because it's going to let so many people who couldn't access the normal education system in the States access education, but it's also going to let so many people around the world access knowledge, like you said, right? Well, we're coming up close on time here. I think my second last question I have here is when you think about the courses that you've taken and so, so forth, I'm just kind of curious, are there any courses that you plan to take in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. The reason I'm struggling to answer this is because one of the benefits of my job is a lot of really great course creators have, have asked me to help, especially in that October to December timeframe. And I, I got like a sneak peek and got to attend many of them. So I did Ali Abdal's YouTuber, Robbie Crabtree's former speaking, August Bradley's Notion course, Marie Poulin's Notion course. So it was just like, uh, it was like, for me as a learning nerd, this was like a dream come true, right? Like pay me, just let me do, do these courses and then I'll give you my thoughts on them. So there's very few that are that I haven't done yet. One of the ones I'm, I'm interested in is a guy called Chris Fox who does He's a performance coach and he does a, a team performance training is his program. And it's sort of more of an accelerator, like 12 people go through that. And it's sort of more about leadership productivity, which I know like topics you talk a lot about on the on this show. So that's one I definitely want to, I want to get better at leading a team and being a better 
just also leader myself. So that's that's probably the one that comes to mind for me right now. Awesome. And I think my last question I have is one I was talking about the future, right? But let's go back and pass. If you could go back 10 years in time, where were you at a time 10 years ago? And what advice would you give yourself? Yeah. So so 10 years ago, I was, I'd just come to the States. I was 11 years ago, basically. But yeah, so I came here and I came here with, it was a two year thing, a two year rotation, basically. So I was supposed to go back and I sort of treated it as like, I'm going to have a party. And I was came to New York, met a bunch of uh, young, young people and just like had had fun. And I think what I would say back then is I would I would encourage my, that my younger self to to be more deliberate about writing down ideas that I was I was I was sort of writing a little bit myself but like writing and publishing ideas that I was thinking about at that time because I've just seen so much benefit from doing this now in the last year or so by the biggest thing is attracting other people who are thinking the same thing, right? Who are, who can help you move these ideas forward and you can help them. And, and so it, it's just, it's, there's so much potential for this now. Like we talked about earlier with the internet, that just putting out your thoughts in a way that don't worry about what people think about it. Like you will find the world is a massive place and you will definitely find people that agree with you and that feel that think the same way and can can help you sort of you'll find the others that are working on similar problems as you so yeah i would have probably taken that part of it a little bit more seriously earlier on because i've just seen it like accelerate what i'm doing right now amazing well it's been an absolute pleasure just catching up and uh i don't know what's the word like you know kicking the can <laughs> <laughs> Totally, man. You're 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 a great host, Jeremy. This has been so much fun. Awesome. Well, good shooting the breeze. Now that's the right phrase. Not kicking the can. <laughs> yeah, good exactly. shooting the breeze with you. <laughs> exactly. We, and we could have gone on for another hour. I know for another hour we could have gone so deep. Well, absolute pleasure, Andrew. Thank you so much.